All right. Here we are talking about, oh, and by the way, I happen to have a test here. Take one down, pass it around. Oh, hey, I just happened to. Yeah. Right. Okay. Everybody gets one of those. Everybody gets a test, right? What if no one wants it? Yeah, too, late, too bad. Then we all pass the little late right. to get to the so everything that you're going to need for that, everything you're going to need to know to pass that test is actually going to be displayed on the screen here. Now what we have is we're talking a little bit, we're just touching on electronic transmission issues, right? And so in other words, how they work and all this. So uh, your solenoids, you notice how this whole schematic is set up. Uh, when your solenoids off, look at your fluid flow. When your solenoids off, you basically see how the fluid is basically going in there. And you know, when the solenoid, it's, in other words, it's venting, and then whenever the solenoid's on, it passes through. And so, if you look at all these little things right here, your number one, your armature. Anytime you see a solenoid like this on a schematic or anything, you're basically if you see two X's like that, that means there's a winding there, and there's wires going to it. Um, anytime you see this little. Uh, armature, you see how this thing right here raises up. You see it squeezes the spring, how the spring is relaxed there, and it raises up there when it's energized, it's going to pull that up, and it's going to change the fluid flow. You know, typically the fluid is going to flow through it until you uh, energize it, and then it shuts it off. That's typically the way I always remember that. Uh, so, you know, if you got your solenoid de-energized, fluid pressure in a spring left check ball off its seat. And it lets the pressurized fluid to flow through the solenoid through the shift open into the sump, which is bleeding off. The sump is, remember where that's the fluid? That's where your fluid reservoir is. That's your sump. Okay. Uh, PCM energizes the solenoid. Uh, armature overcomes the spring. That's not complicated. It raises it up. When a shift solenoid is energized, it exhausts line pressure sent to the shift valve. Spring force moves the shift valve so the valve blocks the port, prevents line pressure from being routed to the collector of the band. So your shift solenoids control shift valves in the valve body. That's pretty much all there is to that. Um, and you've got an electronic pressure control solenoid. It's a current controlled variable four stop sprint solenoid containing a solenoid that regulates valve. The, most, the clearest thing you can, if you've ever, any of you guys remember from engine performance and all, these uh, idle air control valves on these Fords are actually the more current they apply, the more it pulls against its spring and it lets the air go around the throttle plate. It's very similar to that. Uh, the difference is, how does it, do, how, we talked about this before, if you lose power going to your transmission, what happens? If you lose power going to your solenoids, what happens? Oh, it uh, increases all the fluid pressure and puts it in uh, high gear. It puts it in high gear and it raises the pressure all the way up. And it does, why does it raise the pressure all the way up? So it don't want to slip. You want it to, you don't want soft, easy shifts whenever you're, you know, getting on it. That's what I'm always talking about. If you've got one that's got a shift, you know, uh, valve that with a hook to a cable, don't ever leave that disconnected to you or the transmission will burn up. Um, if it fails shorted, which is zero EPC pressure, you'll handle third and fifth gear. It'll slip in second and fourth with high input torque on, you know, these transmissions here, which would be your 4 or 55 e and all that kind of thing. If it fails open, you got maximum EPC pressure. You see that? Uh, it's, and it's, it makes it a false vehicle speed sensor code when it does that too. Uh, so here you got an electrical connector here on your electronic pressure control solenoid. Uh, you can see your electrical connector there. Your exhaust to your sump is going to be your number two there. That's kind of going out the side, but it's going to the sump anyway. Electronic control pressure to main regulator. You've got low current command is maximum pressure. High current command is minimum pressure. So you got spring there, there on number four. I can't find it before. There's a spring right there. Spool valve armature coil. That. This is a cutaway of it. Pretty cool the way the Ford did that. Uh, all right, torque converter clutch solenoid. It can be a duty cycle or a pulse width modulating solenoid. Now, what do you know about a torque converter clutch solenoid? Exit going lockup. Exit going lockup. So, when does it go in lockup? When do, when will it not go in lockup? When you stop. No. I mean, when it stops is not a bad answer. Probably when you're when you're pulling a trailer. When you're pulling a trailer, you really. Yeah. Turn well, that's takes that that let, doesn't let it go into fourth gear, but it can go into lockup. Why is it good for it to be in lockup when you're pulling a trailer? More power. No, better gas mileage. No, not just that. More power. 
Not, 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 not that either. It keeps the transmission from overheating. When it's in lockup. How does it do that and why does it do that? It's basically not shearing the fluid because all the heat comes from the turbine converter, right? Got that? So if you actually, have, if you run it into lockup and you hold it in a lockup, you t when your little tow haul button, that takes it out of overdrive. That kills overdrive, but you've still got your direct drive all the way through. Huh? Tour converter is still going to lock up even if you're not in overdrive? Yeah. Overdrive is actually uh, overdrive in third. In other words, third and fourth, if you've got a four speed and the fourth is overdrive. Third is when, it, when that lockup happens and it stays in lockup when it goes into overdrive. But it actually is in lockup in both of those gears typically. Uh, Alright, your pulse width modulated uh, solenoid is capable of operating at zero percent or and if it's completely released a hundred percent it would be that and between that you got a variable pressure for control clutch and what that is is basically means that you're doing a uh, a sort of a modulated thing if you'll look at your scan tool when you're watching your torque converter lock up a lot of times your scan tool will say 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent 40 percent it actually controls that slip on the way up uh, during the control clutch application mode it's rapidly turning on and off by the pcm at varying rates incidentally let me say something about electronic throttle control you know how you got that electronic throttle control over when you mash the throttle plate and it spring loads back? You've seen that? Did you know that that spring is not the only thing that closes that throttle plate? The engine controller is actually dithering that voltage to close it and open it. So it's not allowing the spring pressure to do the closing thing. It forces it closed. And if you look at it with a scope, you can see that kind of thing happening. A lot of people don't even know that, but that's the way those work. There's a lot of crazy stuff the way that they do that stuff because they can do it in nanoseconds. Uh, in the past, torque converter solenoids were known as modulated converter clutch solenoids, MCCC. Uh, so you got to be that pulse width modulated solenoids are usually low resistance solenoids. Why would they need to be low resistance? So, I mean, maybe not to generate a lot of heat. Not that. So you don't have to send a lot of current through there? Well, that's part of it. Well, do you want it to happen fast? Like if you've got injectors on a hot rod car, are going to have a lot less resistance on a than a normal car. Like if you've got a supercharged, you know, uh, stud horse of a car that you're going to burn the wheels on, you'll typically have two or three ohms resistance in injectors. You'll have like 16 in a regular car because you want it to happen quick. Power stroke diesels, they got two ohms of resistance, and they use 115 volts to operate the injector. That's the old, you know, first generation power stroke. Uh, so you got to look at your resistance of your solenoid right now. Uh, I will tell you that uh, Amber's uh, Saturn, back when it was still running and it didn't uh, kiss the bridge and all that. Hey, it's still still runs. Running. Cool. It's a race car. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that particular thing, her pulse width modulated uh, um, pressure control solenoid died. So it quit working. And what were your symptoms, Amber? One half of my wire step. Bam! It was hitting hard. And we went in there, unplugged the wire from the transmission, found the right cavities, measured the resistance to the solenoid, and it was wide open. The only thing she could do was put a valve body in it. So she bought a $200 valve body in her, and you do it by yourself or you, you know. And her folks thought that she was a nut for even attempting that, but she drove the car for a long time because she crashed it. All right, engine. Uh, if it fails shorted, your engine's going to run around vehicle shutters, engine stalls and drives. You know, the one that we worked on the other day, me and Brian, and where's Brian? Brian disappeared. I didn't exactly. even realize he wasn't even in here. But, uh, but we're driving this uh, vehicle the other day for this lady, and she she brought it in for a, for a, felt like the brakes were pulsating. Well, when we drove it, when we cranked it up, it was idling too fast. And then we drove it, and whenever we were slowing down, we noticed that it would go, uh, and then it would kick into the, it would just drop out of gear. And I said, well, that's interesting. That sounds like torque converters staying in or something, you know. Uh, and that particular screwball uh, deal was set up so that because the throttle position sensor wasn't at closed throttle, it was confused into not downshifting with the way that they had tapped the algorithm in that one. And all we had to do to fix that transmission problem was put a, tel a TP sensor on it. Hi, Rick. Yep. My dog, I'm um, a four haywire. I unplugged that TP sensor and it quit doing all that. Yeah, it'll do stuff like that. There was another one. It was a Dodge uh, diesel. 
that I was working out that, that they, this guy was going to buy it if we could uh, fix it so that it wouldn't hunt in and out of third and fourth gear going down the road by the uh, dealership over there. And we've had, you know, Jeep and Chrysler and all that stuff, you know. And I said, uh, well, they give it to me and they said, uh, this thing hunts in and out of gear and uh, we, the transmission shop that we were buried in the service department, they said, we run it over there right quick and they said, put a TP sensor on it. And if that didn't work, they had to go into the transmission. And so they gave me a TP sensor somebody got from somewhere and it didn't fit. It was a diesel now, it's a diesel. So I said, well, let me just see what we see. So I plugged the, the scan tool into it, put a breach to the whole part of the S system and, uh, you know, it read the serial number and it said, uh, by the way, there's a reflash on this. Uh, you know, you want to know what it's for? You know, it's telling me about this. I said, sure. So I did the reflash, clicked on that reflash, and it told me, it said that uh, the reflash was for the transmission shifting in and out of third going down the road, which is exactly what they were talking about. And I said, do you want to do this reflash? I said, sure, I'll do the reflash. And so I did the reflash, and I got a sticker and put on there saying I'd reflash it and all that kind of thing. And they drove it and it was fixed and a guy bought the truck and they brought me a, a $25 uh, steakhouse gift certificate. So they were so happy that they sold the truck. I mean the sales department did all that. But see the thing about it is a lot of times you can go really, really deep into one when you didn't need to do all of that. Pulse width modulated torque converter flex solenoid looks like that. Not really that big of a deal, but you can see what the uh, fluid's doing and all that kind of fluid input from the solenoid regulator valve to number six down there. And then uh, you got a variable fluid output the converter bypass clutch going the other way. This is not complicated. Now, this was a book I got when I was going to a class, and I got bored and I drew a picture. So, you know, give me a break. All right, so the indicator lamp. Boy, I talked about his indicator lamp one time before. When I pushed the button on the end of that stalk and that indicator light lights up, how did that happen? Did my little button turn that light on? Uh, well, I say. Huh? One indicator light. The one on the end of the stalk, your tow haul button. Oh, no. I mean, you know the. It goes to the transmission. It goes to the PCM, and the PCM turns on the light. Yeah. But it happens so fast that you swear you turn on the light for the button. I mean, there's no lag there at all. As soon as you touch it, bam, the light's on, and you're thinking, "Well, I turned on that light with my button." But if, if you look, it goes and comes back. From the uh, but the transmission control indicator lamp will also flash on some of them if there's a problem. And on some of your Honda cars and stuff, your D-light will flash on the, you know, shift indicator if there's stuff going on and all that. Uh, there's an input. An input's going to send a device to the engine controller and outputs an actuator where it makes things happen. All right, so these right here are all inputs that affect transmission operation. Who knows what that one is? Very good. Read the words. All right, number two. What's that? Speed sensor, what's that? Mass airflow. Mass uh, huh? Mass airflow. Mass airflow, what's that? Position. That one? Electronic it's going to be your ignition system. It's paying attention to the uh, RPM. Yeah. What's that one up there? Right. Yeah, yeah, that's your boost switch. All right, number seven. That's why so whenever you're running the, some of the key on engine running test, you're supposed to tap the brake, you know, whenever you start it, because it can't tap the brake and it has to get you to do it so it'll know it, it's working. If you don't have to break up all your code, transmission fluid temperature sensor, turbine shaft speed sensor, intake air temperature sensor, air conditioning clutch, engine coolant temp, 4x4 low, transmission control switch, all of these. See, they got 16 inputs right there that can affect your transmission. Who would have known that? So, so you got input devices that are directly related. They're only for transmission operation, and then there's some that aren't directly related, uh, which would be like engine control, anti-lock brakes, air conditioning. You know, your air you need to know if your air condition is on or not. Is that cool? Are you guys finding your answers as you go? All right. Transmission fluid temperature sensor. These are the ones that are directly related. See that? There's five of them that are dedicated for transmission. And they don't have anything to do with anything else. Now, your, what is your turbine speed sensor good for? Hello? I'm waiting for the obvious answer. Well, it tells me about my turbine speed. <laughs> Why do we need to know that? That's how fast the shaft going into the transmission is turning. The output shaft speed sensor is, is measured too. So why does, it, why does it need to know turbine speed and output shaft speed? What would you do with that if you were Mr. Transmission Controller? Uh, wait, 
Here is the rat, if it's spinning the right speed, it knows how fast the engine's spinning, it knows how fast the turbine shaft's spinning, it knows how fast the output shaft's spinning. Some of them have got an intermediate shaft speed sensor. Simple fact is, it's able to help you by telling you, I got an incorrect gear ratio obtained for third gear. It gives you something to go by, right? All right, so your transmission fluid temperature sensor, this is something that if you've been through any of the electronic stuff, High temperature, lower resistance, lower temperature, high resistance. If you remember, that's negative temperature coefficient. Right? Don't you love that font? Does that know what space is on? Huh? What? Oh, spaces? Yeah, that one there was, this was converted uh, whenever I turned it into a PPT and it messed it all up. Negative what? Negative temperature coefficient. Yeah, the transmission fluid uh, temperature should be located on the internal wire and harness typically. Uh, it'll be in there. All right. Transmission uh, indicator lamp. That's a TCIL. You know? All right. Now, right here, the PCM. You got input devices that are not solely dedicated. Throttle position sensor. Engine controller uses that. Part of the engine control system monitored by the PCM. Potentiometer on vehicle. And then you got the PCM operates the electronic pressure control, torque converter, push, and shift scheduling based on this. Right. Uh, if you're going into it deeper, it's going to hold gear longer, etc. cetera. Uh, the malfunction occurs, the PCM is going to recognize the signals out of spec, and it will operate the transmission at maximum EPC to prevent transmission damage. Remember I was telling you about that one that was in response to the DP sensor, it uh, was doing crazy things, you know, not downshifting like it should, because it didn't know you had let off the gas. There was another one this lady brought in, it was an Oldsmobile, and it stalled on her when she was getting ready to pull into the drugstore over at Walgreens or somewhere, and she threw it in park while it was still rolling. And then after that, it, the transmission acted crazy, and her husband just swore up and down that she had damaged the transmission. And it was an automobile similar to the one we got out here, or the one that's sitting over now. And um, the only thing that was wrong with that one was it needed a mass airflow sensor. And all the transmission issues went away when we put a mass airflow sensor on it. So uh, think about that, you know. I mean, but you got to be able to parse this stuff, right? The brake on off switch. It's normally open and allows reference voltage to pass when the vehicle, uh, you know, when the brakes are applied. And there are also, when you tap the brake on most of them, it drops the torque converter clutch. If you want to see if the torque converter clutch is working. Now we had one, you know, you just tap the brake and it usually drops out and back in, but you got to make sure that strategy is there because well, some of them it's not. There was a, a, a Aerostar that I worked on one time that had a four, uh, A4LD transmission in it, and I had the uh, portable vehicle analyzer hooked up to it and it was doing something that felt like a surge, and it was shifting in and out between third and fourth so fast that you couldn't even hardly see it on that graph, I mean, a little square wave graph. And so uh, what the, uh, the engineer up there says, uh, and you'd never believe what that was, he says, the little seal that's on the end of the input shaft is leaking fluid, and the torque converter is slipping, and that's confusing it. He says, if you want to see if the torque converter is slipping, now listen to this because it's pretty important. When you know you're at 100% lockup and you get it up about 45, 50 miles an hour, if you're going up a hill, crowd the throttle and your engine speed and your vehicle speed should go up together if you're in lockup, right? If the engine speed picks up speed more than the vehicle speed, you know it's slipping. Most people wouldn't even notice that. But the engine controller, that old Aerostar, OBD-1, it was confused as all get out. And it was shifting in and out between third and fourth, and the, and the customer was actually feeling it. And, uh, but the guy said, some of those are happening so fast, you can't even tell they're happening. That's kind of, you know, pretty crazy stuff. But that's what, that's some of the stuff a scope is good for, if you got a scope. All right. In, incidentally, I put some oscilloscope uh, stuff in some of your people's folder. You know what I mean? If you're confused about oscilloscope stuff, it's a really great little get you acclimated to the oscilloscopes where you understand them better if you missed that on a previous semester. The engine coolant temperature or the cylinder head temperature modifies a reference voltage and so basically you're looking at the temperature. If the car is, if the engine is cold, the torque converter will not go into lockup. Can you imagine a situation where the engine was too cold all the time and it wouldn't go into lockup, right? Uh, when I initially started doing this, it was like 175 degrees is when it would go into lockup, but if it was staying below that, like if you got a bad thermostat, it might not go into lockup. Duh. If it won't go into lockup, check and see if you're running too cold. That's not too hard to figure out, right? All right. Mass airflow. 
used for electronic pressure control scheduling, shift scheduling, and torque converter apply and release. And then your vehicle speed sensors, vehicle speed, shift scheduling, torque converter, clutch operation. See, a lot of these have got to do with all that stuff. Wheel speed sensors are used to send vehicle information on the ones that are equipped with a multiplex communication network. They let the ABS measure the wheel speed, they multiplex it over to the other modules, you know, go to the ABS, obviously, and then it goes to the instrument cluster and the PCM and all that. And it says, if I've already got vehicle speed over here, why do I need a redundant sensor for that? AC clutch, look at that. It adjusts EPC pressure for additional load on the engine, torque converter modulation when the AC clutch is engaged, and shift scheduling. You would ever think the AC clutch would do that, but it affects your shift scheduling. Think about that. Intake air temperature sensor, they use it for EPC pressure control. And it's located in the intake area there. And there's your electronic ignition. So you've got CO so pressure control. All these things, everything we've been talking about, can affect EPC pressure control and shift schedule. Also, you're, not all that stuff. If you think about it, if you understand this, and that's one of the reasons I'm talking about all this stuff, there's a whole ton of things that can affect the way the transmission shifts, how the torque converter works. I mean, lots and lots of stuff that can do it. And that's why it's a good idea to do, I was telling Daniel earlier, when you're working on a system you're not really familiar with, dig into that description and operation section and start reading and see what they're going to tell you that you just don't automatically know. Uh, a lot of us like to just fly in there and start pulling things apart and say, I can figure this out. If you're smart, you'll find out all the information first. And before you go in there and say, crap, I wouldn't have done all this extra work if I'd have known that. You know, but I'm telling you, that description and operation page, Identifix, IETN, if you remember that, it's freebie, by the way. And then your uh, your technical service bulletin, you can get from all that or wherever, Mitchell. Uh, 4x4 low switch indicates the transfer case is in four-wheel drive low range. Modify the shift schedule for lower gear ratios. You remember I told you about the one that the fuse was blown and the 4x4 low ride wouldn't work and because of that the PCM thought it was in 4x4 low all the time and it would shift all the way into high gear before he hit 20 miles an hour and he rebuilt the transmission and then he was working and working and working on it for about three or four days and he called me over there and I said wait a minute your 4x4 low ride don't work let's see if we can get that fixed and whenever we put a fuse in there and woke up all of those indicators on the dash his shift scheduling was okay he wasn't factoring that in all right, here we go. Transmission output devices. You got control solenoid, torque converter clutch, all these solenoids. Remember what I told you about these solenoids here. You might think that when it shifts from first to second, solenoid one's energized. When it's fixed, second to third, solenoid. It ain't that way. They're all over the map. You just gotta look and see how that how that all works. It's not as simple as you would think. You know, these things are coming on in all different categories. And on the Asian transmissions. The torque converter, I mean the solenoids, will all be hardwired to ground and they'll be fed with power. On these transmissions, they're hardwired with power and they're fed with ground. That's typically the way they work. Just remember which way they go so you don't always assume they're always going to be ground control because they're not on every vehicle. All right, you got your transmission control indicator lights and output, like I was talking about a while ago. Malfunction indicator, EPC, torque converter, all those are outputs. Not all of them are going to use a third or a fourth shift solenoid. And here's your basically how all that looks. You got 16 different things here, and you got all of these out here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight outputs. And so there's no use in going through that. So the transmission operation, here we go. You got to understand the operating strategy. The customer might feel the transmission is shifted funny when it's cold. You got to be able to identify the transmission is operating on a cold shift schedule. See? If it doesn't know it's cold, and I have seen engine coolant temperature just as light and say that it was warm when it was actually cold, it might make it shift different. Of course, you're going to have engine stuff going on too, but it's sometimes putting all that stuff together, just like the TP sensor on that other one. If the PCM was receiving a faulty ECT ridden, uh, it may make it shift like it's cold when it's hot or hot when it's cold, either way. And so uh, when the vehicle is cold, the PCM takes action to speed the warm up. Prevents the torque converter clutch application. Now, how does that make it warm up? How does it warm up quicker when you don't lock the torque converter? It holds Part of it, but it also shears fluid and the transmission heats up faster as well as that. And obviously, it's going to be cooler. Uh, excessive temperature. When a PCM determines the engine transmission is at maximum safe operating temperature, it's going to take action to prevent overheating. 
it maximizes torque converter clutch operation. You remember what I told you? In order to try to save it, if it's getting too hot, it's going to do your torque converter lockup. Reverse lockout. If you're driving down the road and always you've got reverse lockout, don't assume it's got it. But well, let's say what happens is, uh, you know, somebody is flailing around because they're having an argument and you're driving down the road 60, 70, 80 miles an hour and somebody reaches over here and uh, slaps it up in reverse. It won't go into reverse when you're, yeah, it's, it's a reverse lockout. Uh, and then you operate during rolling. You remember the one I was talking about, my 95 Taurus, when I go to back up, I couldn't back up more than about 30 miles an hour and they go, rrr, 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 and cut off the injector. Um, but they weren't, they're not all like that, so don't assume, you know. Uh, you got default programming, failure mode effects management, and limp home strategies. All loaders are closely, you know, together. Uh, the PCM not only contains programming for the engine and automatic transmission, but it has programming to substitute input signals during various failure modes. If it knows it can't trust a particular signal, it'll substitute another one that it thinks is close enough. It's basically saying, I don't know what he's doing, but I know he's pretty close to him, and so I'm going to pay attention to him, and that's how we're going to shift, right? That's how we roll. AX4N control system. The processor may engage a torque converter clutch if it receives information on high engine or transmission temp. Um, I have seen them where, and talking about Daniel doing air conditioning this time, I've seen them where the, uh, the engine coolant temperature sensor would be lying about it being too hot, and the AC clutch would cycle off for like five minutes at a time. And they say, why does my AC stop cooling for like five minutes and then start back cooling? And it turned out it had a bad ECT sensor causing that. I, I ran into that myself. Uh, the vehicle will still be drivable, but the owner will know something's wrong. And during an extremely cold operation, it may keep the converter clutch disengaged to reduce the possibility of engine stalling and allow for faster warm up. All right, under normal conditions, it follows a set shift schedule, but a different shift schedule may be used in certain conditions. Um, Here's one, um, the uh, uh, transmission that I saw, they had what they called fuzzy logic that they used on some of the uh, Mitsubishi slash Chrysler operations. Uh, have you, you guys use cruise control a lot, right? Who ever got cruise control? Who uses their cruise control a lot? Okay, do you get disgusted whenever you start going up a hill and it kicks into the lower gear when you didn't want it to? You don't like that. Well, they had this fuzzy logic algorithm typed into some of the Asian transmissions and they say, look, we know you would ordinarily shift, you know, they'd be talking to Mr. Transmission Controller, we know you'd ordinarily shift gear at this speed and at this load and at this throttle angle, but this guy's using cruise control and he's not going to want that, so let's just hold this gear a little longer and maybe we can get by without downshifting. And the TCM say, okay, we'll do it that way. <laughs> it was fuzzy logic, that's what they called it. I read about it in one of the things that come out. It's really important to read up as much on this as you can because you'll get smarter and smarter the more that you read. Uh, okay, so you got a turbine speed shaft sensor, a vehicle speed sensor there, and then you're, there's your 4R70W, that's like in the, you know, the old AOD transmission they're calling it. And that, uh, if the uh, VSS signal is used to provide speed inputs, if the output speed signal cannot be read by the PCM, the VSS will be used. That's the one I was talking about. Okay, so you got, and this is various different transmissions, how they'll do. Uh, the PCM uses a torque converter. Uh, Signal to you, I mean, excuse me, the turbine speed sensor signal to determine PC pressure. And it uh, uses that. To, uh, hey, there you are. Did you know we were in here? Okay. All right. The AX4N uses both a turbine shaft speed sensor and a vehicle speed sensor. See, and they've just given you all of these. Um, we used to see a lot of them that would have a little bit of a torque converter stuff. Uh, there was a little handout that some of you guys picked up a copy of about yeah. calculating slip speed. Did you remember that one? The one about calculating slip speed? Uh, I had a, they were laying there for a long time and several of you wanted copies of them, so I made copies for everybody. Uh, so, that's it. You told me about the class, so we got two minutes left. No, it can't got us. Yeah. That's for our 70W. Now, right here is your little operating strategy thing. Limp home modes allow the vehicle to be a bit. So, with the transmission range and deposition, the transmission may have only one year available, second or third for most of them, fourth year for 4R100 and 5R55E. If the selector lever is moved to the 1 and 2 position, the lower gear is available, so it'll kind of shift like that. On the Jeeps and stuff, a lot of times you could, you could shift it manually, but you, it would shift automatically and just take off in high gear. This right here goes pretty strong, and I probably what I'll do is make a uh, 
PDF copy available in case you want it. You're not going to remember all this. But these tables right here are pretty doggone good. And I like to go to these things.